Please have a seat. We're going to try to begin. Ladies and gentlemen, fun as it is to talk to each other, please have a seat. Good morning. I am Michael Cott. I am the director of uh, FHI's Department for Civil Society and Peacebuilding. Um, it's my pleasure to say good morning to you. Many of you are former colleagues from other organizations as well as from now USAID and formerly FA AED and FHI. It's a particular pleasure um, to participate in a, a meeting devoted to the um, uh, or, or in the context of the Civil Society Index, which I remember working on when it was first um, created back about 22 or three years ago. And uh, the original criteria um, were being developed then. So it's a particular pleasure to be a part of this discussion. I wanted to introduce you, introduce to you um, Deborah Kennedy, who is um, the CEO, our, our COO, who um, has had a long, long and successful career at USAID for about 30 years, if I'm not mistaken. Tw oh, thank you. Um, and has um, been with us um, for the past, what, eight years, five years. Um, and with that, I welcome um, you and, and ask Debbie Kennedy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. It's great to see this room open. Uh, welcome to FHI 360 um, in this conference facility. We're really, I love these events when we're talking democracy and governance because that's the field that I work the longest in at USAID. We're a member of the Alliance for Peace Building and hosted PeaceCon here for two days and it was just a bustle and I imagine that the discussion today will be that exciting. So today we're here to launch this, this year's the 2018 Civil Society Organization Sustainability Index. I'm somewhat of a news junkie and I always try to say, you know, what is the state of the union or the state of civil society and what was it in 2018? And, and as I glance through some of the summaries of the reports, I would label it challenging, but with a few bright spots as you look at it. The challenges included mounting legal obstacles, intensifying political polarization, challenging economic conditions, and disinformation campaigns targeted against CSOs. But there were bright spots, and I'm going to allow the speakers today to talk a bit about the bright spots as well as the challenges, rather than me try to give you a less than adequate summary of those bright spots. But the report does really well. Needless to say, in the midst of all this turmoil, the role of civil society cannot be understated. And social media, which gives voice and representation to many, including those on the margins, and has been a tremendous support to civil society groups trying to step up their engagement, their advocacy, their awareness campaigns, also has a dark side as is illiberal governments attempt to regulate that and to hijack that space for information campaigns. And I think that will probably be a theme is how do we manage this two-sided um, coin of the media. The 2018 index highlights the, uh, some of those challenges I mentioned and many others in its overview of civil society sectors. It covers 72 countries. I did this launch last year as well. It was 70 last year. So it's 72. They've added Libya and Mexico. Um, and I understand there's going to be another one next year. So it just keeps growing. 
So in the 72 countries that it covers, they've spotlighted civil society resilience in closing and inhospitable environments. It talks about the struggles and accomplishments of CSOs, opportunities for improvements, and impediments limiting long-term sustainability. For the next few hours, you all will delve into some of the most pressing issues that global civil society faces. From Myanmar to Libya, Ukraine to Mexico, we will unpack the innovations that development practitioners observe as CSOs adapt to complex operating environments. This discussion and this index seeks to contribute to solutions that donors, development practitioners, research communities, and affinity groups seek as we support a more independent, self-reliant civil society. I want to thank everybody who was involved in the production. I was doing some math before I came up here. So 72 countries, it's a very participatory index process. So if you assume six or seven persons per country, and I know in some countries that discussion was much more robust, you're talking about the work and the results of more than 600 individuals. And then there's the job of synthesis and discussion. I know that the team here at FHI 360 deeply appreciates the support and the confidence that USAID has placed in us to be able to be the rector along with our partner ICNL in pulling together this index. Um, and I want to particularly recognize the work of the local organizations contributing to this. Thank you all for coming today to participate in this timely discussion and to share this moment with us. So now we'll get to the meat of this stuff. So it's my honor to present uh, today's keynote speaker, Don Chisholm. He is the Deputy Director of the Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance Center at USAID. He's worked in international development for nearly two decades, although I think prior to the development, his work as Peace Corps and as a JAG officer count very much in terms of international development. He's been with USAID for more than uh, 10 years. He's managed rule of law, human rights, crime prevention, civil society, elections programming. He served in three continents, including Kosovo and Afghanistan. As I mentioned, he was a Peace Corps volunteer, a U.S. Army JAG officer, and worked for the State Department, INL, as well as for implementing partners. So he brings a breadth of experience to the conversation today, and I know it will be interesting. So Don, please come up. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, although I'm relatively new uh, to the DRG Center, I'm not unfamiliar with the, uh, with the index. Uh, I was in Mexico prior to coming here, and we introduced the index uh, to the region. I didn't know at the time that we were the first country in Latin America, but I'm glad to be part of the team that, that expanded the, uh, the index's reach into, into a new region. Um, as, as has been mentioned, AID launched uh, the index in 1997. It covers 73 countries, 24 in Central, Eastern Europe, uh, Eurasia, 32 in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, seven in the Middle East in North Africa, and, and nine in Asia, as well as one in Latin America. So it's, it's got a tremendous reach right now. And the DRG Center is delighted to be funding uh, the index with support from other uh, offices in the, uh, in the agency. It's now implemented, obviously, by FHI 360 with ICNL and many local partners. Uh, two other countries were added to the index this year, Myanmar and Libya, in addition to Mexico. And the index is piloting expanded data inputs uh, to the reports, university partnerships, and uh, public outreach as well. The reasons we brought the index to Mexico are the same reasons why the index is so important for us all across the agency and in our work. Civil society is an incredibly important actor. In many of the countries we work in, there's really no robust system of checks and balances between the three uh, branches of government. And what we're seeing primarily is the executive branch dominates and what civil society does in these countries, it becomes effectively one of the only few checks and only one of the very few voices uh, for accountability of, um, of the government. 
So it's important from that perspective. It's also important because civil society presses the government to um, come up with solutions to development um, challenge that, it, that's, that are in that specific country. It also plays a role in helping the government sometimes get to those development solutions. And so the civil society has an incredibly important role and it's abundantly clear that it's key when we talk about the journey to self-reliance it has an incredibly uh, critical role. Now the journey to self-reliance uh, for those of you not familiar with the way that we are, are looking at sustainability issues is the ability of a country to plan for, finance, and implement solutions to its own development challenges. It's key, civil society is key in developing both capacity and the commitment needed to do this, needed to have a successful journey along uh, to self-reliance. Those are the two pillars that we see when we talk about um, journey self-reliance, capacity and commitment. And the work of the index is so, it's so well respected and so critical that the CSOSI scores uh, are part of the metrics used, the secondary metrics that we use to measure uh, as an agency the progress of civil society in the countries in which we work. In an, in an important but a little bit different lexicon, um, civil society and obviously CSOSI is important for our work uh, in developing our local systems approaches. Uh, local systems approaches uh, entail helping local actors come together, define the development challenge, and work together to resolve them in a sustainable way. So at some point we can withdraw from this process and they can sustainably uh, address the development challenges that they see. So obviously when we talk about local systems, civil society is, is a huge part of, of how the systems work and we have a huge head start in being able to understand from a mission perspective where a specific country is on the seven dimensions uh, that CSOSI mentions. It gives us a huge head start in trying to figure out how to engage uh, with local systems in that specific country. So I assure you, I can assure you that the CSOSI, the index, isn't just an academic instrument that remains on, on bookshelves and missions. It's actually actionable, it provides a wealth of data that is used not only in defining how we want to implement design specific projects, but also when we come up with strategic approaches. Um, every, every five years, AID has to, and the missions have to come up with a five year strategy. Uh, the country development, um, the cooperation development country strategies. And right now we have about 40 missions uh, going through this process, either this year or next year. So this provides a wealth of information for those countries as they try to figure out what are the opportunities, what are the risks, where, uh, what actors are, are we going to work with, what are the challenges. I mean, the ability to understand what the positive and negative trends are, the ability to understand the enabling environments for CSOs, and the, uh, the ability to see what sustainability looks like over time are all really important factors that these missions are taking into account as they sit back and they try to figure out where they want to go over the next five years. I'd like to finish just by recognizing the hard work of those involved in putting together the index. When you think of everything that has to be done to bring this index together, the 73 implementing partners in the field, the 73 um, panels of experts, Deborah, Deborah mentioned that each one has at least six, we're talking six or seven hundred at least experts in the field. When you consider the job of reviewing, of developing, reviewing and editing 73 wit written work products, it's just, it's incredible the amount of work and the complexity that goes into putting together the index. Um, thinking of it from the perspective, I was once in the implementing partner world, the first thing I thought of as I, as I looked through these details was, wow, this would be keeping me up as an implementing partner at night, just because there are so many moving pieces to bring together um, the final work product. Thanks to 360 and, and all of its partners uh, for their work in producing the index and also for hosting us here today. This is a great facility and I hope the discussions here today are, are very fruitful. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Joseph Sani, 
technical advisor at FHI 360. So as we have been talking and celebrating as well the contribution of uh, people around the index, I think we have key people, key voices we wanted to bring into this conversation. Those are our local implementing partners. So you will hear from uh, Lebanon and Albania, I believe. Armenia, uh, some of their own, in their own voices, their experiences, and the added value of this work uh, as, they, uh, as they try to move things in their own country. So throughout the day, you will be receiving, you will be viewing and listening to those voices from, from the field. So I bring to you Lebanon and Armenia. Hello, my name is Sonia Musiyan. I am expert at Civic Development and Partnership Foundation of Armenia. 2018 was a turning point in Armenian political history. In April and May, country experienced some of the largest protests and demonstrations since its independence in 1991. In response to the protest, the current authorities announced their resignation. This political transformation was dubbed the Velvet Revolution. CSOs played an important role during and after political developments in 2018. CSOs quickly mobilized a significant number of people in support of the protests. They played an important role after the revolution, pushing anti-corruption and human rights agendas and preparing for and monitoring the election processes. CSO sector's overall sustainability increased in 2018 with advances noted in all dimensions. Advocacy improved as CSOs played a key role in the political transformation. State harassment of CSOs decreased, resulting in an improvement in the legal environment. A significant number of donor-funded capacity building projects fostered improved organizational capacities. The infrastructure supporting the sector increased, with new and improved platforms for CSO dialogue and cooperation. CSO's public image improved due to the increased visibility of CSO's in the media and improved perceptions in the aftermath of the Velvet Revolution. The CSOSI report has been an important tool in the hands of academics, researchers, journalists and decision makers in order to assess the work of civil society organizations in Lebanon. This year the findings were really a bit surprising when we look at indicators such as advocacy and public image really increasing from the last years from 2014 till 2018 and at the same time we see that the legal environment on the contrary, is deteriorating. This is an important indicator that as much as public authorities feel that CSOs have an impact in the society, as much that they try to restrict their work and even limit the establishment of new CSOs. Okay, so behind those testimonies and those voices, we have put together uh, a robust methodology. And so I'm going to walk you through this methodology uh, in, in a summarized way. So, the, as explained, the CSOSIs uh, look at the civil society sector through seven dimensions. So, some of them are self explanatory uh, you have legal environment, organizational capacity financial viability, advocacy service provision, and sectoral infor infrastructure and public image. I will come back on sectoral infrastructure because that's where we get some of the questions. We, what we mean by sectoral infrastructure is uh, the, the infrastructure that allows CSO organizations to be effective and sustainable. So the networks of uh, intermediary services, uh, resource centers, so those are the type of things we look at. And under each of those dimensions, we have indicators. So, dozen of indicators under each dimension. And we will use those indicators to provide scores. So, the CSOSI uses a seven point scale scoring system from one to seven. And as you will see, so the higher the score, the harder it is for CSOS, uh, or, uh, civil society organization to be effective and sustainable. So that's a logic. So you want to look at low scores because the lower the score, uh, the, the better off, I should say, 
civil society organization are operating under that dimension. So each dimension is scored from one to seven, and we broke the, the scale into three great categories. So we have from one to three, that's called sustainability enhanced, meaning that a civil society organization in that, uh, under that dimension are better off or improving. And from 3.1 to 5, that's what we call sustainability evolving. And from 5.1 to 7, that's sustainability impeded. So as I said, you want to, we want to see civil society on the lower end of the spectrum. And the next phase, so those are the three, uh, the, the, that's the scoring scale. But the most important thing, and everybody has mentioned, is the process itself. We will try to walk you through the process. So the scores are obtained uh, through a multi-step process. At the beginning of the process, we have our implementing partners. So our implementing partners throughout the 72 countries are trained to the methodology. The core of the methodology is expert panel. So our implementing partners will bring together experts from different walks of life. The key things here is the diversity of voices, geography, and expertise. So the expert panels each have a level of expertise in the seven dimension of uh, the, the index. So the expert panel is held and facilitated by implementing partner. The implementing partner is trained on the methodology to make sure that the power dynamics and uh, the anonymity, etc., is taken into consideration. So each expert panel will then score uh, the civil society sectors under each dimension. So during the expert panel meeting, so they will discuss their various scores and they will agree on a general score per dimension. And the sustainability score will be the average of all the scores given by panels. That's not the end of it. The expert panel, the, the implementing panel, will also add some li literature review, additional research. In some cases, we are piloting a process whereby we will send out additional questionnaires to bring in more voices. So, Debbie, when we said 700 voices, very soon we may have 1,000, 3,000, depending on how well we do with the questionnaire. So we are trying to make it very participatory because we recognize that just one person sitting in this room and writing a report about civil society may, have, may contain many biases that we want to dilute. So we will want to bring more voices. And in some cases, we are also partnering with local universities to provide more rigor into the, the, the report as well. So when the report is done, the first draft is done by the local partner, they will send it to our partner ICNL, who will then work the, record, uh, the report to check for some accuracy, uh, articulation, the narrative, the clarity of the narrative, and the, the, uh, the harmony between the narrative and the facts on the ground. Once ICNL is done, the report goes back to an editorial committee. So the editorial committee is composed of representatives from ICNL, USAID, FHI, and a regional expert. As you can see throughout that process, because it's a qualitative process, it's cumbersome, but we want to make sure that the final consumer of that product has something that is reliable, the analysis is sound, and the facts and the narrative are accurate. So after the editorial committee, the report goes back to the, I, uh, the IP because we don't want to disempower the IP. We want to make sure that our comments in the editorial committee actually reflect the reality on the ground. So the IP will take the report again, will review the report, and also USAID missions in the country have a say. So they will also give their feedback, and the report will come back to ICNL, and there will be a back and forth between ICNL and the IP, and once there is an agreement, we will then push the report to the publication. But that, after the publication, the partner will then run again dissemination activities in the country, bringing in 
uh, the news, me the media, and policymakers together to discuss the report. So that's, in a nutshell, the process we follow. At, at the end of the day, we want, it's a qualitative process, but we want it to be as rigorous as possible, as reliable as possible. So now, I will introduce Jennifer. We will actually show us the type of information we can pull out of the reports and the trends of 2018 reports. So, Jennifer, please. Thank you. Hi. Thanks to Sani for pro providing that overview of the methodology. Um, I am Jennifer Stewart. I'm the program manager at ICNL for the index, um, where I have the uh, pleasure of um, editing and overseeing the editing team for these 72 reports. Um, and today I have the fun job of summarizing some of the main trends from this year's reports. Um, if I can figure out how to do this. There we go. Um, so as has been discussed, the various editions of the index cover 72 different countries. Um, I also did some math earlier and discovered that there's nearly 600 individual scores and over 1,000 pages of texts in this year's editions of the index. So obviously I'm just going to be covering the tip of the iceberg today. Um, this map shows an overview of the different categories of sustainability where the 72 countries fell this year um, that Sani introduced. Um, as you can see, most of the countries fall within the yellow range, which is our middle tier or sustainability evolving. 50 countries fall within there. Um, the green countries indicate the highest levels of sustainability. Unfortunately, there are still only seven countries that fall within that range, um, all of which are in the Europe and Eurasia region. Um, and as you can see, according to the scale, there is also theoretically a blue uh, range of sustainability enhanced where none of our countries have reached yet. Um, on the low end of the spectrum, there are 15 countries that are in the, the red range or orange range, um, which is sustainability impeded. That includes nine countries in Africa, four in the Middle East, and two in Europe and Eurasia. I keep going the wrong way. Uh, this map shows how things changed in 2018. Overall, 2018 was a pretty positive year. Um, the countries shown here in green are countries where overall CSO sustainability improved during the year. Red countries are where sustainability deteriorated during the year. Um, so you see we had 19 countries where the score improved, um, including some in each region, 10 in Africa, 7 in Europe, 1 in Asia, and 1 in the Middle East, and 12 countries where things deteriorated. Um, this is almost an exact switch from how things were last year where we had 20 countries where things got worse and 12 countries where things improved. Now that we've looked briefly at what happened with overall CSO sustainability scores across the globe, I wanted to take a quick look at what happened by the individual dimensions that Sani talked about. This chart shows the average scores for the seven dimensions across the 72 countries. Um, as you can see, there's not a huge variation in terms of where those average scores um, work out, but we do see that advocacy is the strongest dimension, perhaps because of all of that wonderful USAID support that often focuses on those advocacy organizations. Um, all but seven countries have advocacy scores that are either enhanced or evolving. On the other hand, financial viability is still the weakest dimension. It's the only dimension where the average score still falls in sustainability impeded. Um, and over half of the countries, 37 to be precise, um, still have scores that are impeded in this dimension. CSOs in these countries tend to have limited access to funding and often rely heavily on foreign sources of support. In contrast, just two countries, Estonia and the Czech Republic, have scores in sustainability enhanced um, for financial viability. CSOs in those countries benefit from significant amounts of government funding, corporate support, and individual philanthropy, while foreign support is a relatively small source of revenue for the sector. This chart, I wanted to show a little bit about how things changed in 2018 um, by the different individual dimensions. Um, so the black line across the middle here is kind of the baseline. Anything that is above the line shows the number of countries where the score for that dimension improved, while below the line shows the number of countries where things deteriorated. And it's color-coded by region. Blue is E&E, &E, yellow is Asia, green is Africa, and red is MENA. Um, there's a couple key takeaways that I wanted to point out. First, if we look at the legal environment, you see that there is a lot down here in this negative side. And the legal environment deteriorated in 33 countries in 2018, um, including some from each region. Um, among the countries with the greatest declines in this dimension this year were Poland and Thailand. Although the situation in these two countries are obviously quite different, 
they both indicated an increase in harassment by government officials um, as one of the main reasons for the decline. On the other hand, CSOs in the Gambia and Ethiopia both reported dramatic improvements in their legal environments as new governments adopted much more constructive attitudes towards the sector. However, these countries still have very weak legal environments that fall well within the impeded range. Another dimension with some dramatic changes during the year was financial viability. Here, however, you see that the story kind of varies by region. Um, in E&E, &E, which is blue, you had quite a few countries where things improved. Twelve countries had improved financial viability during the year. These were fueled largely by advances in public funding, individual philanthropy, tax designations, and social entrepreneurship. On the other hand, in sub-Saharan Africa, you had nearly half of the countries where um, financial viability deteriorated. This was caused largely by shifts in the availability of foreign donor funding. Um, moving on to advocacy, things were very positive. We have all sorts of stuff happening um, on the positive side of the graph here. 41 countries, including 25 in sub-Saharan Africa and 10 in Europe and Eurasia, reported improvements. Um, some of the most notable changes in this dimension this year were in Africa, in Ethiopia, uh, the Gambia and South Sudan, freer political climates led to significant improvements in CSO advocacy. And as our um, local implementing partner discussed in Armenia, civil society's role in the Velvet Revolution demonstrated its capacity to quickly address the needs of, pop of the population and shape the public agenda, which led to a big improvement in advocacy there. Um, finally, I want to move on to public image. Here we also have a very different picture um, based on the region. In Africa, things were quite positive. 16 countries reported improvements in their public image. This was generally boosted by positive media coverage and better public understanding of CSO's work. And in many countries, there seemed to be a link between the improvements in advocacy that we saw here and the improvements in public image. There was a similar trend in the Middle East. Three of seven countries reported improved public image. Um, but interestingly, those were the same three countries that had improvements in advocacy, as mentioned by our partner in Lebanon. On the other hand, things were much more mixed in Europe and Eurasia. Eleven countries reported deterioration, while eight reported improvements, um, and were quite negative in Asia, where five of nine countries reported a worsening public image. In both of these regions, the use of negative rhetoric and media coverage to vilify CSOs that are critical of the government played a key role in the widespread deterioration in scores. Uh, moving on, I want to quickly talk about each region and some of the key trends that we saw there. Um, Europe and Eurasia was, of course, the original region that the index covered. Um, this was the 22nd edition of the Europe and Eurasia Index, and it covered 24 countries. This chart is largely taken from our CSOSI dashboard, which I'll show you a bit later. Um, but it shows the scores for 2018. Um, these are little line graphs that are so small that they don't mean a whole lot here. But on the index, or on the dashboard, you, you could see that that shows the historical trends um, since 2005 with the scores. As you can see, for most countries, they tend to be fairly flat, uh, especially when <laughs> so small. Um, and then the red and green arrows show the direction of change in 2018. Um, E&E is interesting because it has the greatest range in overall CSO sustainability scores. Estonia is the country with the highest score of any of the 72 covered in any of the editions of the index, and Azerbaijan, down at 5.9, actually has the weakest sustainability of any of those 72 countries. Um, the picture was pretty mixed in 2018. Uh, seven countries reported better scores, and seven countries reported worse scores. Um, I found it interesting that the two worst countries in the region, Belarus and Azerbaijan, both reported improvements. Uh, that were credited in part to some minor thawing of relations between the government and civil society and a decrease in harassment of CSOs. One of the most striking themes in E&E &E this year was the extreme polarization within the CSO sector. Um, CSO sectors in individual countries, which often mirrored deep divisions in society. This polarization manifested in a couple of different ways. Most commonly, you would see different CSOs within a country taking conflicting opinions, including on highly charged issues. Uh, this was the case um, in countries such as Hungary, Slovenia, and the Czech Republic over immigration, which was a big issue uh, this year, and in Bulgaria and Croatia, where there were heated debates between conservative and progressive CSOs around the Istanbul Convention, or the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. 
In more extreme cases, we see governments purposefully dividing the sector by implementing laws selectively, limiting certain organizations' access to public funding, providing variable access to decision-making processes, and vilifying CSOs with which they disagree. Um, this was seen particularly vividly in Russia, where the report notes that there are essentially two civil societies, one that consists of the numerous organizations that provide services, and the other that comprises human rights, environmental, and other organizations that actively advocate for public interests. And we also see elements of this type of situation in countries like Poland, Hungary, and Belarus. Moving on to Sub-Saharan Africa, this was the 10th edition of the um, Index for Africa. This year it covered 31 countries. Overall, it was a pretty positive year for CSO sustainability in the continent. Ten countries recorded improvements and only two noted deteriorations. Countries at the lower end of the spectrum showed an interesting divergence. Sudan and Burundi were the only two countries with worse scores in 2018, and as you can see, they are the two weakest um, countries in terms of CSO sustainability in the region. But in contrast, Ethiopia, Angola, the Gambia, and South Sudan, which also have scores in the sustainability impeded range, experienced notable openings of civic space during the year and corresponding improvements in their CSO sustainability scores. We already talked about the dramatic flourishing of advocacy in Africa in 2018. Um, the reports also note the important role that African CSOs play in service provision, particularly to populations affected by armed conflict. Service provision has historically been one of the strongest dimensions on the continent, and 13 African countries reported improvements in um, service provision in 2018. Moving on to the Middle East and North Africa, this was the seventh edition of the MENA CSOSI, and it covered seven countries, including Libya, for the first time. Um, overall, CSO sustainability was fairly stagnant in the region. Um, Iraq was the only country that registered a change, which was a slight improvement. As you can see, Lebanon has the highest level of sustainability in the region, with a score of 3.9. Egypt has the weakest with a score of 5.6, um, and Libya came in quite close to, to Egypt, so obviously also a very uh, impeded environment there. The legal environment was an especially challenging dimension in the Middle East this year. New restrictive laws and practices affected CSOs in nearly every country in 2018, and government harassment continued to be a major problem for CSOs in almost every country in the region. Despite the fact that the legal space for CSOs grew more constrained, CSOs did not stay silent. Advocacy remained the strongest dimension for CSOs in MENA, um, and in 2018, the score for advocacy improved in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, while remaining relatively robust in Morocco and Libya. Um, CSOs in these countries advocated through both formal and informal channels on issues such as election laws, human rights, taxation, corruption, and conflict resolution. On the other hand, however, CSO's ability to advocate in Egypt and Yemen remains severely constrained. Um, our last region that we have is in Asia. This was the fifth edition of our Asia Index. It covered nine countries this year. And as you can see, the overall levels of CSO sustainability in these countries continue to fall in a pretty narrow band um, within sustainability evolving. The Philippines came in at 3.5. Um, Thailand had a score of 4.9. In 2018, overall sustainability deteriorated in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and Thailand, and improved in just Sri Lanka. One of the clearest trends that we saw in this edition of the index was that of closing civic space, with governments clamping down on freedoms of association, expression, and assembly. This manifested um, mostly in three dimensions of sustainability, the legal environment, advocacy, and public image. Um, we saw governments passing restrictive legislation and implementing legislation governing CSOs restrictively while also harassing civil society actors. Um, and at the same time, governments were shutting CSOs out of the policy-making process and trying to delegitimize CSOs in part by controlling media coverage of the sector, thereby tarnishing their public image. Bangladesh, Cambodia, Thailand, and the Philippines all reported worse scores in all three of these dimensions, and Sri Lanka, Indonesia, and Nepal experienced restrictions in one or two of those dimensions. Uh, finally, as noted earlier, the index continued its quest for global domination this year by expanding into Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, Mexico is our first country from that region. We're excited to have it. Um, 
overall sustainability there fell at a 4.2, so kind of right in the middle of our scoring range in the sustainability evolving category, with all of its individual dimension scores also um, generally in that range. Public image was deemed the weakest dimension of CSO sustainability, while the legal environment uh, was viewed as enabling the sector to grow and evolve and was considered one of the strengths of the sector, along with service provision and sectoral infrastructure. And finally, uh, I've obviously only been able to scratch the surface uh, today in terms of all of the information and data in the index. For those of you who are interested in delving deeper into the data, I encourage you to vis visit our CSOSI dashboard or explore at CSOSI.org. If things work, I'm going to give you a brief demonstration to try to whet your appetite to look a little bit more. Um, it's an interactive site that includes historical data and reports from the index and allows you to m manipulate the data in different ways. Um, so you see we have a map that shows all the countries that I showed you at the beginning. You can click on a country. It shows you a quick overview. If you click in, um, you can see how the scores changed over time. Um, you can also go up to the top and look at different years and get the reports from those various years um, to download if you're interested in a specific country. If your interest is more on the regional level, you can look at a specific region. Um, it zooms in on the map. You can also then go to several of these links. There's a list that provides an overview of the different countries and how their scores changed over time. Um, if you hide the charts, you see the, uh, the bar graphs that I showed today on the presentation. Um, you can also look at time trends, which shows you the data this way. Um, over here, you can change around if you're interested in just seeing how individual dimensions changed over time. Um, you can also look at correlations to compare how, how various dimensions moved with each other. Um, and you can also download the data if there are other things that you want to play around with and look at that, that the, the site does not currently allow you to do. So again, I encourage you to, to take a look at that, play around with the data. If you find any interesting correlations that are worth exploring, please let us know. We'd love to, to hear about anything that we haven't thought about. And with that, we will um, move on with some more voices from the field. Thank you. My name is Boniface Giagavis. I'm a journalist based in Mau, uh, which is a town just situated next to the Wabango Delta. I think uh, the recent uh, civil society index uh, will help government uh, communities, the private sector in Botswana, appreciate the role of the civil society in Botswana in terms of its contribution to, to developments. Uh, something that comes clear from, from this index is that, you know, as Botswana is a middle income country, Civil societies in Botswana are lacking access to funding, and I think one thing that could be done as a remedy, you know, is actually set up a fund which will contribute for, uh, for the financial sustainability of our, our civil society. I think a very strong civil society is a strong Botswana. There is definitely an increased interest for the sustainability index in Moldova during the last years. In particular, we observed a bigger interest from the government for the report. The new strategy for civil society development, for example, contains many references to the sustainability index. There are several long-term projects starting in 2019 in Moldova with European Union support that decided to measure the impact using the sustainability index and especially measuring the dynamic of the indicators during the next years. We, as a capacity building organization, of course, we are adjusting our strategy every single year uh, according to the trends we observe in the index. Of course, it is impossible to cover all the 12,000 organizations registered in Moldova in this report, but we are doing our best to have a group of experts as diverse as possible involved in the panel discussion and to get feedback from as many stakeholders as possible. In this regard, we would like to express our gratitude for all those involved in this process. Donors, experts, editors, for helping us to write the history of the civil society every single year in Moldova.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Barney Singer, and I'm the technical director for civil society leadership and capacity development programs here at FHI 360. And I'm delighted to welcome our panel for a really interesting conversation. Um, as Jennifer noted in her presentation, there are a lot of um, attributes that were unique to the various countries um, that participated in the index this year and over the, over the many years. But there are also a number of cross-cutting trends that emerged, some of which were alluded to um, by Jennifer and the voices from the field. And what um, we'd like to do with this panel is to explore a little more deeply three of those cross-cutting trends. Um, the first related to um, ways in which civic space is under attack and the resurgence of authoritarianism. A second related to emerging technology and the ways that that's being used to restrict fundamental freedoms. And third, um, how civil society is being of service in areas of conflict. To help us uh, understand more about what's happening with regard to each of these three cross-cutting trends, we have a terrific panel here. Thank you all for being with us today. Um, first, I'd like to introduce Saskia Brechenmacher. Um, Saskia is a fellow with the Carnegie um, Endowment for International Peace, where she focuses on democracy, conflict, and governance. Um, she is also a researcher and an author, including a recent report that just came out entitled, Defending Civic Space, Is the International Community Stuck? Which is something that we will be talking about uh, momentarily. Um, Saskia has also advised um, other funders and private organizations on issues around um, protecting and defending civil society. Welcome, Saskia. Second, I'd like to introduce Zach Lampel. Zach is a legal advisor with our partner ICNL. Um, Zach is a lawyer and an expert on freedom of expression. And he leads ICNL's global programming in that arena, including working on uh, emerging technologies. And so he provides um, technical legal support to CSOs and civil society around the world. Third, I'd like to introduce David Saldivar. Um, David leads uh, is the policy lead focusing on civic space for Oxfam America. Um, he uh, works on um, influencing space for civil society and contributes to Oxfam Global's programs and advocacy on civic space, inequality, and accountable development finance. Finally, we are really pleased to have a voice from the field as part of this panel, and that is Mohammed Abdallah, who is with USAID Libya. So it's super exciting to have him with us, given Libya's participation this year. Um, Mohammed works on stabilization and um, governance programming at USAID Libya, where he analyzes economic, political, and social trends among his many responsibilities. Uh, he also has, in his background, um, having worked for the Ministry of Finance for Libya. So I think he'll add a really interesting perspective to our conversation today. So welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. I'd like to start um, with a question, Saskia, for you, if I could. Um, it, it seems that in the past, there was a clearer line between authoritarian governments and democratic governments. And with the rise of um, populism and nationalist parties in power in many of the countries in which the index um, has been put together, that line seems to have become more blurred. And the trends and the global dynamics um, either have changed in those countries or, or seem to be you know, in the process of changing. So the question that I have for you first, Saskia, is 
how, how is the authoritarianism that we're seeing today different from what we've seen in the past? And how is that affecting civil society? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this discussion. It's really exciting to see the new index, and it's such a valuable resource for um, researchers as well. So I'm very grateful to be here. Um, in terms of your question, I think, first of all, it's important to say that the trends are not all negative, as we just saw. There are a number of bright spots around the world, and um, you know, we'll probably talk about those more in a little bit. Um, but in terms of the trends, it's, it's true that we see negative trends across different types of political regimes. And when we look over the past 10 years, what's really interesting is that we do see um, a decline in the number of liberal democracies and a rise in the number of electoral democracies and electoral autocracies. So these are countries that do hold elections, but they restrict um, civic space, political space, in a way that tilts the playing field toward the incumbent government. And this is not sort of uniform across regions. When we look at VDEM data, I think it's quite interesting to see that we see particularly negative trends right now in Eastern Europe, in Central Asia. So although these are countries that are starting at a higher level, they're generally more free than some of the countries in the Middle East, the trends are very negative. And another important thing to mention is that we have seen negative trends in some of the world's most populous countries. So India, Brazil, the United States in some way. So it's affecting a lot of people around the world. In terms of how the authoritarianism is different, I think a few trends are worth highlighting. Um, first of all, we're seeing democratic erosion happening in very gradual ways. So in the past, when you had democratic breakdowns, they often happened very abruptly. There would be a military coup, a very um, sort of intense crackdown. And now what we're seeing in a number of countries is that it's happening over longer periods of time with governments using mostly legal means to try and restrict freedom of expression, freedom of media, freedom of association. So it's happening in a more subtle way. And, um, the nature of authoritarianism is also changing in some ways. We see fewer restrictions on elections. So electoral fraud that is very apparent. It's still happening in a number of countries, but in fewer countries than in the past. And instead, again, it's uh, countries using these more subtle means that maintain appearance of pluralism. So you still have opposition parties. You still have NGOs operating. But there are certain selective types of targeting and repression that are particularly affecting NGOs that are speaking out about, um, on government abuses, on human rights, that are targeting journalists, um, that are reporting on corruption and abuses. Um, so while there are some countries where the crackdown is very widespread, and China is a good example of that, um, I think there are more countries in which you don't see total government control over media or total government control over the internet. Instead, it's the government selectively targeting critics, using propaganda, um, using sort of their dominance over certain TV outlets and newspapers um, to tilt the playing field um, in their favor. And then perhaps um, another trend that's worth highlighting um, is that you do see a number of authoritarian regimes now playing more active roles both at the international level, trying to influence international norms, um, but also across borders, so trying to influence political developments in other countries. And that means that overall, when we look at transitions taking place around the world, there are just many more actors involved in these types of transitions. So it's no longer just Western donors or Western democracies or the UN, UN but instead sort of a multitude of actors, including some very influential, more authoritarian regimes. Thank you, Saskia. Very interesting trends um, that you're, you're noting, especially sort of the gradual erosion. I think that that is underappreciated because there's so many big things that are happening. Um, a question, a follow-up question about the various actors that you mentioned, and actually this could be for others on the panel as well. In what ways have CSOs tried to push back and to adapt are there ways that they are surviving some of these uh, things that you mentioned? Um, uh, how are they being resilient? Let me, let me phrase it that way. Yeah, um, I can offer some ideas, and I'm sure my colleagues can jump in as well. I think, first of all, it really depends on the context, because as we've seen just now in the presentation, you know, there's a lot of variation in how much space there is available to begin with. So the opportunities to push back will vary depending on how restricted the space already is. 
Um, but a few things are worth highlighting. First, yeah, we see CSOs pushing back against restrictive legislation when it's being proposed. Um, and there it's really important for them to form broad coalitions. We see the examples when it's been most successful. Um, it's when civil society really has brought support, not just sort of across the sector, but also allies and other sectors in the media and the private sector, um, perhaps in parliament. Then you see a wide range of adaptation techniques and ways that CSOs are trying to survive more repressive um, political environments. Sometimes that looks like CSOs actually changing their legal form, so deregistering completely, um, registering as social enterprises, trying new fundraising techniques, um, using more crowdfunding, for example, or sometimes uh, leaving the country entirely but trying to do advocacy from the outside. And I think mm. we've seen those trends in the Middle East, for example, a lot of Egyptian organizations have left the country and are trying to still do human rights advocacy but from Tunisia or from other places. Um, and then there's also interesting work being done around um, sort of new outreach strategies. How can CSOs better reach local constituencies, change their narratives? Because that is an area where governments have such an advantage. They tend to monopolize social media, monopolize um, government news outlets. Um, so for CSOs to actually be able to reach the population and, and shape the narrative around what they do and who they are is really important. And then one trend we've seen in our own research is that even, you, even though you see these legal restrictions, especially on organized civil society, activism still continues and sometimes continues in other forms. So for example, you might see increased repression of NGOs, but instead civil society sort of shifting maybe from national um, issues, sort of issues of democracy and rights, to more localized issues. So starting to focus more on local real estate development, public parks, pollution, local service delivery, things that may seem less political, but are actually very political because they touch on issues of corruption, of economic exclusion, of inequality. And as we're seeing now with protests happening around the world, these very local issues can sometimes spark these much larger mobilizations in Lebanon and Chile and other places. And then there's also an interesting trend of sort of the nature of civil society changing where you might see more restrictions on organized NGOs, but there are also new actors emerging, younger actors, people who are organizing online, creating new online coalitions, pushing back against human rights abuses in more fluid ways. So I think it's important when we look at these overall trends to keep in mind that we don't just look at organized civil society, but also all the other ways people are still trying to maintain, trying to still stay active and mobilize around issues that matter to their lives. Hey, thank you. Anybody else want to uh, respond to that? David, I saw you nodding your head vigorously. Yeah, maybe just to pick up on, on that last point um, where, where Saskia uh, left off. I think, um, I mean, I think one of the things that, that our partners are confronting um, around the world when thinking about resilience in the face of dynamic uh, changing, enabling environments, some uh, frequently um, changing you know, in a more restrictive direction, um, kind of really um, puts the spotlight on, on what is the role of, of a conventional civil society organization mm -hmm. under the circumstances. And thinking in particular of um, the point about working in broader coalitions and, and, um, and what is the role of, of a, of a you know, conventionally organized CSO with respect to more organically emerging dynamic um, protests, social movements, youth activism, activism around climate change, um, the, the economic issues that, that, the kind of bread and butter economic issues that we see um, so clearly represented in a lot of the, the protest movements that we're reading about in the news these days. And I think CSOs are sort of experimenting with, um, with how they can maintain their identity as, as, uh, as sort of um, channels for, for activism in, on behalf of social interests while sort of getting out of the way. And, um, you know, uh, connecting with their constituency by, by uh, displaying a value either as conveners and brokers of that kind of, the, the, the kind of organization that's necessary to sustain some of those, um, so those organic kind of um, bursts of activity while, um, you know, ceding the space to the people who, you know, have sort of, you know, taken matters into their own hands to kind of, you know, go into the streets to join a protest or to speak out, you know, uh, you know to uh, online or, or, or in person about things that they, they care about. Um, so the question then for, for uh, international organizations like Oxfam, or like, like all of you, and, and donors like, like USAID is, is um, as our partners, as our CSO partners are sort of kind of rethinking 
their role and their value, um, how can we also make that transformation so that we're sort of contributing to that, um, that different uh, global infrastructure to, to, to play that sustaining role? Um, and I just would, I think, um, you know, to the one, one last point to, to where you started with the question, I think um, another way that we're thinking of this, this point about coalitions is in terms of solidarity. So one value that we've seen that, and one contribution that an organization like Oxfam can play is to help sort of foster that peer-to-peer -peer connection, either by um, helping to create um, spaces where, where groups can come together, physically or virtually, um, so that um, that sense of solidarity um, among groups that are coming from different contexts but, but experiencing different versions of, of, of similar problems can kind of forge those bonds. Because um, mm -hmm. as, as we've seen and as you know, ICNL and, and Carnegie have shown in, in their work that the states have learned from each other. There have been, there's been modeling across governments in terms of legal regimes, and, um, in terms of tactics, um, sharing technology, and um, we've, we, we really believe that, that CSOs and activists have to sort of do their own version of that modeling and sharing and, and kind of connection making in order to, to maintain that resilience. All right, thanks, David. You know, you, you, you reminded me of something that I wanted to follow up with Saskia about, which is related to the international community. And Saskia, your recent paper, you know, posed that important question, is the international community stuck? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can, you know, share with the rest of us a bit more about um, your, your findings from that and if there are any recommendations that came forward. Sure, yeah, our aim with this paper was really to try and take stock of the international response to closing civic space, which has now generated a lot of discussion for the past five years or so and a lot of international convenings and conferences on this issue. Um, and our sense was that there has been quite a bit of progress and we see new types of programming, we see new policies, new approaches, but there's still a sense among many who've been most engaged on this issue that somehow it hasn't been enough, that it hasn't lived up to the scale of the challenge, that we still see these negative mm -hmm. trends. And so in the paper, we try and outline seven major limitations of the international response. And this is not about individual programs or individual efforts. It's more sort of looking at the macro level. And I can briefly walk through those, and we can go back to any of them later. Um, so first of all, there's still sort of confusion about what this problem really is. What are its root causes? Is this a problem of democratic backsliding, democratic recession? Is this a backlash against progressive causes? Or is this a more specific civil society issue? And so because there's confusion around what the problem is, it's harder to come up with a comprehensive strategy. Second, governments are still not really prioritizing the issue in their broader foreign policy agendas, particularly when they have conflicting security, economic interests. They find it hard to escalate pressure, diplomatic pressure on the offending governments. Three, and I think this comes out in, in, um, in the index, is that we see negative trends in some relatively established democracies as well. Um, and this is problematic on several levels because governments that are themselves lashing out against domestic critics are obviously less likely to speak out against these trends in other places. And even if they do so, they, have, they just have less credibility. Then when we look at the overall resources committed to the, pro to the problem, they're still quite limited. So when you actually try to find out, okay, how much new funding has been made available specifically to combat closing civic space, it's not that much given how big of a problem it is. And that has to do with risk aversion on the side of many donors. It has to do with sort of not being sure what a more a bigger scale strategy would look like as well. And it has to do with the fact that it's a cross-cutting problem. It affects human rights, the human rights sector, the development sector, humanitarian sector, it sort of bridges foreign policy and assistance. So it's, it's kind of difficult to locate who should be in charge of the response. Um, in addition, different parts of the assistance community still have trouble coordinating. This is probably not news to any of you. Um, and then I think some of you mentioned this earlier, civil society funding is still tends to be part of the problem in many places where um, organizations are struggling with financial sustainability um, but dominant modes of assistance sometimes um, reinforce these problematic dynamics with a lot of funding going to bigger international NGOs versus local grassroots groups. And while there have been efforts to try and address this, it's just incredibly difficult because of bureaucratic obstacles, because of the need to show impact, and also risk aversion, et cetera, on the side of funders. And then lastly, 
the problem is simply evolving very quickly. You see new threats coming up in new places. Um, you see new threats in the digital sphere, which I think you'll talk about in a little bit, um, and that we still haven't quite grappled with and don't know how to respond to. Um, so that just in general makes it a difficult problem because we used to think it's about NGO laws and now we're realizing it's about all these other things as well. Um, so in the paper, we talk through some p potential um, improvements to current responses. We also acknowledge that some of these problems are very deeply entrenched, and so they won't change overnight. They won't go away. Um, but there's still things governments could do and funders could do, um, and we sort of go through each of the problems we identify and suggest some, some solutions. But I think on a general level, one thing we noted is that somehow the response hasn't been strategic enough. Um, in, a, in a lot of ways, we see sort of isolated responses trying to tackle specific problems, specific countries, um, or specific thematic areas, but there's not a sense of like, okay, we understand what this problem is, we understand how it relates to our broader foreign policy priorities around defending democracy, defending multilateralism, defending civil society, and we sort of have a response that tries to um, respond to immediate challenges, but then also is forward-looking and sort of thinks about long-term um, priorities and long-term um, strategies. So one thing we suggest in the paper is maybe that major funders um, among themselves, but also individually need to do some thinking about a broader strategy um, and connect it a bit more clearly to other assistance and foreign policy priorities, because that might help bring together some of these individual responses in a more coordinated way. Great, thanks, Saskia. And of course, you, you provided a perfect entree for us to talk about the digital sphere. So I'd like to turn our attention to that topic now. And, and Zach, um, as Saskia alluded, in the past we were seeing um, the enabling environment challenges as related to things like registration and um, freedom of assembly being, being restricted. But things have been changing pretty dramatically over the last couple of years with the growth of new technologies and uh, other ways of limiting civic space. So I'm wondering, could you share with us some of uh, what you're seeing in terms of new tactics that are showing up by authoritarian governments and you know what what does civil society need to, to be aware of at this point? Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you Saskia, thank you Barney, thank you everyone. So when we think about emerging technologies we often think about internet access and so internet access is the key tool that connects civil society with other groups, with their constituents, with governments, with everybody around the world. And one of the new tactics of governments is to prevent access. And I want to highlight two ways in which governments do that. The first is with network shutdowns. All around the world, the internet has been shut down for large parts of a country or an entire country. India, Zimbabwe, Egypt, Iraq, just to, just to name a few. And this has huge, huge development consequences. When Iraq shut down the internet for two days in October around protests, it costs upwards of 200 million US dollars. That was for a two-day shutdown. And these shutdowns almost often occur around protests, around elections, or other types of political instability. The second tactic to reduce access to the internet that we've seen is social media taxes, or blogger taxes. And I'll highlight Uganda's social media tax. It costs a tax of about five cents per day. It doesn't seem like a lot, but if 42% of your population lives on $190 per day, five cents is quite a lot. One gigabyte of mobile data in Uganda costs approximately 30% of the average income per month of the poorest Ugandan popu population. That tax adds 10% of their costs. The burden falls on women, young adults, human rights defenders, and other activists, as they are often the most marginalized communities. As a result of this tax, 2.5 million people stop using social media altogether. Now, if you can actually access the internet, you're left with content restrictions. And anti-fake news laws are the newest trend. But even if a country doesn't pass anti-fake news laws, they often slip in broad, vague content restrictions into cybercrime laws statistics acts, media laws. And that essentially allows the government to become the arbiter of truth. And here I'll highlight Singapore. They passed an anti-fake news law. Their very first use of it was not against a state conducting a disinformation campaign. 
was not against speech that promoted sectarianism, and those are the two main objectives of the law. Rather, it was against an opposition politician for merely suggesting that a state development fund made a poor investment. He was forced on his Facebook page to issue a correction and link to a post that was 10 times longer, which was written by the government. And on the flip side, you have misinformation campaigns against civil society organizations. And that creates a whole lot of complex issues and information pollution, which makes it almost impossible for civil society to get their message across and carry out their work. And these messages are being amplified in new ways. And I'm going to highlight one example, sleeper bots. In Hong Kong, the Chinese government spent years cultivating mass Twitter feeds that had absolutely nothing to do with politics. One was just about promoting the Real Madrid football club. For years and years, it garnered 200,000 followers because it posted interesting things about one of the most popular soccer clubs in the world. As soon as the protests in Hong Kong started, those sleeper bots were activated. And all of a sudden, these Twitter accounts, which had garnered massive followings and had a massive amount of trust amongst its followers, began promoting very political tweets. As a result, the amplification of these disinformation campaigns was multiplied. So I just wanted to highlight a few of those issues. Access and content restrictions make it quite impossible and are new tactics that governments use to prevent civil society from carrying out its work. Thanks, Zach. You know, speaking of, of new technologies being used both positively and negatively, one that comes to mind is government surveillance and particularly artificial intelligence. And so there's so much happening in that space right now. What, what are you seeing as the, the most important pieces? Sure. Well, the, I'm glad you brought up surveillance because when you think about the sort of old days, to surveil someone was a fairly significant cost. You had to have a group of people sort of break into an empty house, install physical devices, microphones or cameras, all without being seen, get out of there, listen to it on a regular 24-7 basis. Now it's all remote, and we're doing it ourselves. Right? The FBI put out this Black Friday warning a couple days ago. We're now bringing in cameras and microphones into our most private spaces, our living rooms, our bedrooms. That creates a whole new opportunity for governments to remotely hack into and surveil what we're doing wherever we are. So we have this with televisions. Uh, we have this with phones, the NSO group, which has just uh, been sued by WhatsApp group for hacking in. And then we also have facial recognition. And these are all tools or software that really harness artificial intelligence and machine learning to draw connections and patterns and alert authorities. So the cost of surveillance has decreased dramatically. And as a result, we see increased surveillance on civil society activists, human rights defenders around the world. But so the question really is, what can we do? What can we do with our governments? And here we'd like to think, sort of disaggregate what we mean by governments, because there are multiple types. So in sort of democratic governments or rights respecting governments, we really need to assure that there is appropriate civic oversight. Lots of these surveillance methods are simply not known to the public. But once they are, there tends to be a grassroots massive effort to halt these types of extra legal or illegal surveillance efforts without appropriate public oversight. Uh, Seattle was a great example. Their police department was using ISMI catchers, cell phone catchers, unbeknownst to the public. As soon as the public became aware of it, it lobbied its city council to make sure that the police could not use new technology without prior approval from the city council. We can also ask our governments to restrict the export of surveillance technology. This is something the US government and the State Department is looking into, as well as a number of Western European countries with regards to groups like the hacking team, the NSO group, these technology companies that create surveillance hacking tools. In some of the sort of in-between countries, CSOs need to become more actively engaged on the issue and increase their own digital literacy. 
We often find civil society organizations saying that's not an issue that we deal with. I think we're at a point in time where we can no longer say we can, we'll be okay if we just deal with offline traditional issues. So we need to help increase our partners' digital literacy. That's something we're doing at ICNL with the start of our tech camp in cooperation with Stanford. And finally, we need to make sure that CSOs are not part of the problem. We often fall into the trap of sort of convenience and coolness. But what is the effect? And I'll highlight the World Food Program using facial recognition and iris scans to provide money and food to Syrian refugees. Yes, that does reduce fraud, but what is actually happening to those images and to that private biometric data of the most vulnerable populations? What steps are being taken to ensure that that information does not contribute to a larger surveillance state or exploited by a private company that the World Food Program often partners with to promote other types of surveillance, tracking, or privacy violations? Thanks, Zach. Speaking of vulnerable populations, I'd like to turn our attention now um, to David's work about civil society that's serving in crisis um, response. Um, what we've seen, David, is that... Sorry, my microphone is uh, slipping a little. Okay, thanks. Um, we know that effective humanitarian work um, requires access for people, uh, for international actors, for local actors. You have to be able to get into the countries, into these, these vulnerable areas that are affected by all kinds of different kinds of disaster and conflict and insecurity. But what's, what we're seeing in part is um, political and other kinds of administrative impediments to that. So my question, David, for you is, you know, what, what have been the impacts on international and you know, civil society actors who are trying to provide this you know, really critical support? And what, what are some of the security implications that we need to be aware of? Yeah, thank you for, um, for the question. And, and I'd also just like to say, as uh, along with my colleagues, thanks um, for having me as part of this and thank you um, for these reports, it's such a ter tremendous resource, and, and the way that it, that they're produced, you know, really working, you know, um, uh, starting from from the, the partners, I think is, is so important. Um, you know, to to address the the question, um, I think for one thing, you know, outside of the the context of the issues that we're talking about, um, we and, and other uh, humanitarian organizations have found that um, good practice in terms of humanitarian response. Um, tends to start with with, um, with with supporting the the kind of frontline local partners as as the core principle. So um, you know those partners that are that are the ones that are kind of you know feeling the the most um, you know the strongest impact from all of the the issues that we're talking about today. Um, you know are are also sort of the 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 focus of. Uh, locally led humanitarian response work, um, separate from from this discussion. Um, so because of that, I think it, it's you know just really sort of um, uh, all, all of these these issues around um, uh, local partner resilience, um, access to resources, um, legitimacy, security uh, would, would all be present um, even if we weren't talking about uh, 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 authoritarian and repressive restrictions on civil society. Um, I think um, in a, a crisis-affected context, whether um, through conflict or natural disaster, um, another thing that we found and that our, our peer organizations have found is that um, the, the same issues that we're talking about around administrative and legal um, uh, repression um, uh, are present, uh, just as they are in more stable situations. Um, Sometimes what, what's, what, what can be different, um, although I think it's a matter, more a matter of degree than, than, um, than sort of a, a binary on-off thing, is the, 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 the balance of incentives on the part of the, the controlling authorities, whether that's the, you know, the, the state government or wh whichever power happens to be kind of um, you know, in de facto control of, of a piece of territory. And so as you say, I mean, um, 
the, the, the benefit to being able to collaborate with communities and um, their representatives either formally or informally organized in order to address urgent human needs, um, that's often very apparent for, for states um, you know, uh, dealing with violent conflict as well as, as disaster situations. Um, balanced against you know, the potential risk um, to you know, expanding, um, you know, basically to, to sharing authority, sharing um, access and, and, and kind of representational role with the communities that are affected. So um, I think you know, it, it's, it is true that, that oftentimes um, the experience of working through uh, a crisis response with um, uh, local civil society actors and, and their international partners can have the effect of sort of bolstering those those mm -hmm. actors um, in the recovery period um, and changing the relationship between between governments and, and CSOs. Um, but I think that that it's it, it's equally true that um, you know, we've seen in you know, more frequently in in conflict situations than in disaster response that that um, you know that empowerment of local civil society is felt to be you know, a threat sometimes to, to governments, and so that can. You know, manifest in, in some of the restrictions that we're talking about, including um, enhanced um, surveillance uh, using the, the kind of most up to date techniques for that. Um, I want to, uh, you know, I think one, one example that's sort of um, present on, on my mind right now, just because of some, some current work that we're working on, is the, the case of a country like Mozambique, um, which is both sort of a, a, a you know, you know in, very much in a conflict recovery um, phase, but also. Um, has been dealing with uh, some severe um, natural disasters in response to that. Um, and then just went through uh, national elections um, where we saw some, some attacks, some, some, uh, some unfortunately fatal attacks on, on independent media and civil society organizations. And so the question you know, for, for an international organization like Oxfam that's doing both humanitarian response and trying to bolster um, CSO partners that are trying to engage in the governance of those, of those countries and enhance public participation and, and decision making over natural resources, um, uh, development agendas, is um, you know, having, you know, having established some social value through um, meeting, you know, saving lives, meeting needs, you know, doing sort of that, that most urgent service delivery. Um, is there an opening to kind of translate that, you know, you know that experience into a more functional um, role in a, in a, in a decision-making process with a government that's more open. And I think, you know, as, you know, as kind of comes through in the reports, uh, while we can sort of you know, outline some of the, the analytic trends, it's always going to be very context-specific mm -hmm. and, and sort of and, you know, dynamically changing um, based on things that aren't always you know, predictable. David, I'd like, to, I'd like to probe one thing that you mentioned, which is sort of the, the tension between government and civil society that's showing up in these, in these conflict environments. How can civil society you know, both engage in vigorous advocacy and uh, peace building activities on the one hand, which some people think is anti-government, if you will, at least some governments see it that way, while at the same time, they really need to build their legitimacy in order to be seen as a partner with government. What can, you know, what can be done in that kind of a challenging scenario? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think two things come to mind as sort of a, the beginning of an answer, um, both of which my, my colleagues have, have referred to. I think one, you know, on the question of building legitimacy and thinking about that, um, in two ways. One, in terms of um, sort of reinforcing the, the role and power of, of CSOs as a, a legitimate voice and a legitimate actor in the eyes of a government in terms of the public processes around how that, that place is governed. Um, so that's one aspect. And then the other is, is um, uh, in the eyes of the people that the CSOs you know, are, are organized ostensibly to serve. Um, I think those those are sort of core existential challenges mm -hmm. for so many of our partners right now. Um, and you know, the stakes are so high that even trying to you know, open the conversation, like the, just the term, like just kind of proposing that CSOs 
you know, global and local need to, to, to critically reflect on their legitimacy is a very frightening prospect, I think. Um, and I, I think, um, you know, one of the, the beginnings of an answer is, is in part, like what, what Saskia mentioned around um, taking some time to consider the deeper narratives around what CSOs are, um, who the people that form them are, what, you know, what they represent, and how that is perceived by the communities that they serve. I think there's a lot more that our sector can be doing collectively to, to more rigorously and systematically engage with these questions around um, perception and the stories and narratives that, that are sort of commonplace around civil society and activism. Because it's definitely true that, um, that the CSO adversaries have found ways to, to leverage public narratives um, and sort of you know, uh, manipulating the image of CSOs and activists in order to achieve their end. So I think, you know, uh, we've seen sort of the beginnings of more uh, cooperative action among international civil society and, and, and uh, groups and, and act actors working in the kind of closing civil society space, space, so to speak, around this narratives question. But that's, I think, going to be a, a, an area of increasing importance. And then just quickly, the other thing um, that I think also is uh, responsive that that's um, part of the solution is just the point about um, uh, coherence across the various strands of what, what donors and multilateral institutions are doing in their engagement with, with the governments where, where, where these dynamics are happening. Um, and I wanted to pick up in that regard on, on Zach's point about um, taxation, in particular something like a social media tax, where you know, at the same time, the, the, we're sort of in, in rooms like this and events like this talking about smears and disinformation campaigns and sort of the pretextual use of some of these regulatory instruments. Um, it's also true that there's sort of a parallel, you know, you know donor agenda around, um, you know, modernizing development assistance, f uh, fostering greater reliance on domestically mobilized resources, including um, more support uh, to the governments for, for tax administration and tax compliance. And I bet you that most of the time, the different bits of the donor organizations um, that, are, that are engaged in both of those things aren't talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that the, you know, the media development and democracy and governance people are talking to the economic growth people that are doing the kind of the tax administration support. And, and that's, I mean, and you can think of, you know, I think numerous examples in that regard, but it just sort of uh, you know, illustrates the point about one, one of the things that, that we can do on our end is sort of try to achieve that that greater coherence across development objectives, diplomatic objectives, and sort of different donor priorities that, that relate to this stuff. Great, thanks. So one of, the, one of the countries where we're seeing these tensions play out as well as the, the cross-cutting trends is in Libya. And so, Mohammed, we're, we're really happy to have you here to um, you. speak about your perspective. Um, you know, Libya is, has been facing uh, internal conflicts with the, the interim government and others have, you know, various kinds of crises. So, um, can you share with us about the, the impact that that's had for civil society? Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, and thank you for having me. So, basically, it's like uh, the, the current situation now in the country is, has impacted the, affected the civil society organization rapidly. And, and and this, like, uh, it comes through a different perspective. Some to mention is like the security situation, rather than respect to the implementation, program implementation, and the movement within the country. And also the networking, networking and partnership uh, between the organization in the east and the south. Because basically now the civil war goes between, mainly between the eastern side and western side. And this is restricted the movement between the, also like a coordination among the uh, civil society from both sides. Uh, as well as the uh, political division also caused division within the civil society commission itself. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is like we have two civil societies commission, one in the east and one in the west. This is like even make it like a more problematic. Mm -hmm. I mean, and some of the uh, civil society organization if they want to operate in the both sides, so they need to register with the two commissions. I don't know if this is like uh, happened in other countries or something, and then if there is any solution proposed to this kind of program. And the other thing is the, uh, and some of the challenges that faces the civil society, it's the uh, lack of free movement. So for example, like an organization in the, 
in the cities in the southern region, so basically they can move even like within the city in the same region. And due to the uh, tribal issues and conflict uh, sensitivity between, even sometimes it's challenging for them to move within the same city, it's like from neighborhood to one neighbor to another. Because there is a lot of, for example, like uh, in the city of Sabha in the south, which is they consider as the biggest city in the south region. So, and they have like some Tabu, Tuareg, and Arab living in the same city. So basically it's like a, the neighborhood restricted for particular tribes. So they can't someone else go into the other mm. neighborhood because of the, their uh, identity or, or things. I mean, it's, this is like a commonly happen in the south. And even like in some other like regions because of the tribes mechanism in the country. And the other thing is to mention is like the tribal factor, as I mentioned before, it's uh, negatively used the conflict. I mean, the conflict part is used the tribes as negatively as a challenge to the civil society restriction to I mean, restrict the work, the civil society work. And the other thing is like so also to mention the political instability and contributed to a holding relationship development between the civil society and government. And governments involved in the conflict do not consider the civil society as a partner yeah. and uh, in proposing solutions. So basically there is no attention being paid like by the government to the civil society as a part to be able to sort of see the current situation or the current war. And the other thing is like the, uh, the, the sharp political division, some organizations classified as a political, politicized, and lie to a certain, but to a certain group, which is like a, some of the civil society, they take, they become like politicized towards certain groups. There's like in the conflict, uh, which has affected their repetition and their trust by among the citizens or the, uh, the other thing. And for all the mentions, like a, we can say that the activities in the civil society are not like before. I mean, at the beginning like, of the revolution, I mean, civil society was like, uh, involved like, roughly in the revolution. But the thing is, like, uh, we don't have the uh, kind of like, a knowledge and how the civil society like, a work in the country. Because before the revolution, I mean, within the old regime, the civil society was, they say like, the definition of the civil society, it's like uh, welfare and mm -hmm. humanitarian and help only. So there is no definition that the civil society can participate in the DG work. But it's like a, the revolution is like a, things like start moving forward. So basically it's like civil society at the beginning, like a, they start having like a, the internally displaced people and the clashes and, and, and so on. And the other thing is like, uh, and also the civil society has not tended to address important issues in the country because of the uh, clashes. So it's like most of their concern and focus will be like within the community, how to monopolize people, how to, to help su to provide support and, and things like that to the injured, the displaced. For example, for example in, the, uh, in the current clashes now in Tripoli. So a lot of civil society mainly focus on how to mon move people, find like accommodation for people, pr like try to link the link connection between the international communities and the, uh, the local organizations and how to find like a ways. And also the other things like uh, in, when it comes like uh, to the coordination between the civil society and the international community, it's been a bit limited because of the uh, ability of the, the knowledge and the skills that civil society has. Great, thank you. One, one final question in our last minute uh, for the panel. Um, you've, you've pointed out the, um, the lack of le perceived legitimacy by the government vis-a-vis -vis civil society. What is, the, in your opinion, the most important thing that civil society could do to improve its relationship with government and better represent its uh, constituencies? I mean, it's, it's a bit difficult in the current time, especially like when it's, uh, there's like a two governments involved. So basically it's hard like for civil society in one region to be working the other region because they will consider it like they are allied to the other region. 
and this make it like more comfortable, uh, the more uh, complicated to solve. I mean, and I think it's like a mainly now it's like a most of the civil society they just consider to work like a locally in their communities, and they mainly focus on the issues that is like community faces in a daily basis, like a service delivery. Uh, awareness of like uh, the collecting trash from the streets, uh, encourage people to recycle, and just to improve the community in, in, in the services on a daily basis. Okay, thank you. Sure. And let us thank our wonderful panelists for their very thoughtful <laughs> comments. Thank you. We're going to very quickly move to the next uh, part of our agenda, which involves um, small group conversations at the back of the room. You will see signs up on the tables, and you're welcome to uh, join whichever group is most int of interest to you. I think um, the uh, groups you can find on your agendas. If you'd like to refill your coffee quickly as you make your way back to the tables, please go ahead and do so now. And thanks again to all of you. David, we didn't. All right, everybody. So we know that you are deep in the middle of all of your discussions, but it is time to wrap up. Uh, and so uh, what we hoped is that this is just the beginning of your discussions on all of these themes that have come out in the CSOSI reports. And for your reading pleasure, you can click online and read all of them and reconvene to continue those discussions. But we did want to give a chance for each one of the groups to just to share a little bit um, of what they talked about. Uh, and so we do have some of the typed uh, notes from each one of the groups, uh, but it may be a little bit difficult for you to read all of that, so we're just going to have a representative of each group. So for the legal environment, we're going to have Barbara just to share a couple. Maybe you just want to share very briefly some of your main recommendations. Sure. I'll, I'll be brief just to give you an overview. We talked about challenges. Um, opportunities um, to tackle these challenges and we came up with recommendations on um, challenges we talked about uh, new digital cyber crime laws um, affecting civil society um, this could affect access to internet content restrictions social media rules such as hate crime rules things like that uh, counterterrorism being used as a pretext um, to limit civil society and then framework laws uh, continue to be a big issue um, affecting things um, such as funding and limiting funding flows for organizations. Um, the, and opportunities um, to tackle these challenges, um, mostly creating uh, coalitions and reaching out to broader audiences um, to support civil society, um, using advocacy, media, and finding opportunities to, um, to affect legislation um, and issues such as like anti-corruption. Um, in terms of recommendations, uh, we talked about um, teaching civil society to operate within the restrictive frameworks, uh, keeping uh, and keep holding governments to their international obligations and standards, and um, working with local organizations so that they can do the same work. And then we talked about ICNL, had a publication recently um, called Effective Donor Response to the Challenges of Closing Civic Space. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and so moving on to group two, uh, looking at the sort of broad dimension of service delivery, but some of the particularities of working and challenging and crisis environments, uh, we are going to have Eric give us a brief recap. Uh, okay. 
this is, uh, I'll do this on my feet here. Um, some of the challenges we looked at were during the clampdown in civil society, when good governance organizations lose funding, service delivery CSOs may not have developed proper messaging to respond to the challenges. So as you see this global shrinking of space, how are we able to create uh, or support the development of normative narratives in service delivery organizations? Someone pointed out at the table that often it's difficult when you have democracy and governance folks and service delivery folks around the table, they feel that the narrative is, this conversation is too political. They don't want to get involved, they don't want to threaten their opportunities for delivery. But how can we create a space for them to do that? One of the, one of the suggestions was to create focus groups where you have them really work on domesticating a narrative that's soft-pedaled enough where it's substantive and can be communicated on an ongoing basis but helps bolster uh, the idea of uh, good governance and accountability and human rights while at the same time delivering, doing service delivery. The important aspect of this is also to create a feedback loop so that some of these conversations from the service delivery people are being communicated back up to local government partners and even up to um, ministries at the national level, so showing that the values that surround overall civic space are also part of the uh, human environment you're trying to create with uh, delivery in uh, health, education, poverty alleviation, humanitarian assistance. Uh, and I think that's the, and also making it important to really create stronger cross-sectoral linkages uh, between democracy and governance or good governance and human rights sector and the service delivery uh, sectors. Okay, thank you very much. All right, we'll move over to this table then since they were so eager. <laughs> so, all right, Lydia is gonna talk to you. <laughs> all right, well no, the back, so, I mean, this is, this is one of our backbone dimensions as far as organizational capacity and financial viability that runs through all of sustainability. So tell us your recommendations. Well, we, uh, we focused a little bit uh, on the systems approach that uh, where USAID specifically is, is uh, shifting its focus. Um, and in that light, some of the challenges we noted um, that the sector, civil society sector, also is having a, a lag, I guess, in moving away from a donor-driven focus to a more system-focused approach, as in it's been decades where we've been telling them how to do what's necessary in order to get more grants from the funders, and now we're telling them to focus, no, on their local systems. And so that's, there's gonna be, a, there certainly is a challenge there. Um, and also one of the nuts and bolts things is how, how does the system of focused approach where we're working more within, uh, with collaborative groups, um, how does that square with funder, funder or donor requirements for specific um, financial management or management structural, CSO structural uh, uh, stability in order to receive funds either directly from um, the funder or from an implementing partner through a, a subgrant. And then also we were looking uh, a lot at the, the DG space and it's one thing to talk about um, working with uh, education or health or safety uh, and to incentivize people to donate or to pay in some way for a fee for service. But it's a little bit different in the DG space where you're not gonna have someone pay for you to write a policy note about that, right? So we were talking about how sometimes that, that is probably a little bit difficult for DG organizations, but then one of the opportunities we were talking about was also how to hook those organizations in this system approach together so that the DG organizations can work with those other organizations to provide the support that they need and the structure behind a lot of their, their work. Um, there is, of course, the, the focus on building capacity to a point where organizations can receive direct funding or from, um, from established funders, but also from private sector and other local uh, sources of funding. We talked a lot about the um, crowdsourcing and, and other and membership services, other opportunities to improve um, the financial viability of a, of a CSO. And also, of course, the focus in, for the opportunity of really getting, working with CSOs to focus at 
in, within their system on their constituents and who they're working with and for and um, focusing more on their, their issues and their desires to, to bolster the mission of the CSO within that system again. Um, and then I think we had recommendations. Didn't we have recommendations? Did we not really get to recommendations? <laughs> Well, I think I sort of incorporated those in what I was talking about. But um, what we, the point is that, yes, there's, there have always been systems, I guess, is what we were also discussing. They've always, always existed. And what we're moving toward with USAID's journey to self-reliance and the Capacity Development 2.0 methodology or framework is, is uh, um, recognizing that system and the importance of that system and actual sustainability of the CSO sector. Okay, thank you. All right, and to hear from uh, this group about public image and uh, some of the key themes that are emerging there, Chris. Thanks. Um, very interesting conversation. Uh, I think the first thing we decided was we're going to send Josh Mackletter back to 1986. He said, pick up Al Gore on the way, he's going to fix the internet. So a time traveling experience is the first thing. No, um, so naturally the, the conversation kind of gravitated, sorry, Josh, kind of gravitated towards uh, misinformation um, and uh, covered a, a bunch of different things. I mean, um, just recognizing that um, there is a private sector out there that needs to be engaged with, uh, with these platforms. Um, and uh, one strategy might be to, to or one, one that's actually been in, in practice already is, is reporting and removing some of the content of the misinformation that's being, uh, transmitted, um, but there's a rec recognition that um, these platforms are, are, are very much focused on the bottom line. They're very hard to engage with. Um, we've had a little, bit of a, a little bit of success at the country level engaging, but it's very uh, ad hoc and is relationship driven. Um, but there's a recognition that these platforms obviously have a role and should be engaged. Um, also the tools uh, themselves are very sophisticated. Um, and rec one recommendation was that INGOs and CSOs and, and donors need to to be aware that um, there are tools and approaches being implemented that um, they themselves should, should look at and potentially talk about implementing um, in order to get more targeted, resonant messaging with specific target audiences. Um, also kind of a recognition that uh, any campaign, strategic communications campaign or misinformation campaign is tapping into emotion and fear. Um, and there was one, some discussion here about how social listening um, can help to identify flashpoints around which CSO campaigns can be constructed. So being, CSO is being a little, little bit more proactive um, in terms of social listening and launching their own campaigns and, and being less reactive. Um, also discuss strategies to, to disrupt instead of replace, just recognizing that the problem is so gigantic and, and, and widespread that um, we can't really expect to be stopping it for, um, completely and that and you know, inserting ourselves and, and uh, disrupting is, is potentially a good way to go about it. Um, also that the internet has its own vernacular. Um, messages can be packaged around humor and irony and, and sarcasm. And those are maybe some of the things that we as a community aren't doing so, so well in terms of our messaging and how we're responding. Um, talked a little bit about long-term versus short-term um, approaches, media literacy, digital literacy. Uh, I think Josh mentioned that uh, you know, the original, uh, maybe a first, a first baseline of, of interventions, but need to be also followed up with, uh, with some shots, some uh, booster shots uh, over, over time. Um, also discussed a little bit about how CSOs can respond to what I thought of as, as character assassinations, um, and just recognizing that some of these organizations are, are they themselves perceived as elitist, um, and the CSOs could be the CSOs that are better connected and legitimately part of their constituencies are more insulated from such attacks. Um, and so uh, how can we help CSOs to, to be more focused on their local constituents and, and kind of have a natural barrier around them um, when such attacks occur? Um, also that CSOs are not necessarily always formal registered organizations, they're social movements, um, and we need to be more flexible about how we're supporting them. Um, and then, uh, I think that's all we had, actually. Did I miss anything? That's all we had. Okay, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so on behalf of the Civil Society and Media Division of the Democracy Rights and Governance Center, where um, I and my colleagues, Miriam, and a number of you here, as well as our partners in the 
Europe and Eurasia Bureau and the Africa Bureau who work very closely with all of you. We've been really delighted to have all of you here with us today to launch uh, these regional reports and we hope that everyone will be using them. Um, as you saw, there are a number of challenges, but there are also a lot of opportunities. We wanted to give the floor to the acting uh, head of the Civil Society and Media Division uh, to say a few words of closing. Thanks so much. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mariam Afrasiabi, um, and I'm the acting division chief of, of our Civil Society and Media Division in the DRG Center. Um, I was asked just to give a few key takeaways, and I'll promise I'll keep it very brief given I am standing between you and lunch. Um, so first, um, technology, we've heard, is a double-edged sword. It can be used by autocratic governments to hamper civic space, but also by social movements and other actors to defend their legitimacy and mobilize people. So CSOs are utilizing innovation and technological tools to give voice to the otherwise voiceless, to create space in the online realm um, in ways uh, it, where it may not be possible in the physical offline space, and to hold errant governments to account. Um, but also much work still needs to be done by the development community to counter its use by nefarious actors. Um, second, the resiliency of civil society cannot be overlooked, and even in the face of major constraints in civic space, the persistence of civic actors has stood strong, and I think we've, we hear that um, loudly in the CSOSI reports and in the discussions today as well. Um, so even small success, successes should be celebrated because for those individuals, groups, and communities where there has been even the slightest bit of opening, these small successes are, are monumental in impact. Um, and then finally, such determination by civil society must be matched by assistance providers um, with systematic approaches and identifying and responding to this changing landscape of civic space. So we heard from Saskia and others with regards to is the international community stuck um, and, and recommendations in which we can pot potentially better um, uh, align ourselves and better position ourselves uh, to be as supportive as possible. So um, I, I just wanted to close by thanking HI360, ICNL, all of our local partners for being such collaborative um, partners in, in the truest sense of the, the word um, um, on the CSOSI. As you heard, it's a very, very robust um, uh, process and it takes a lot of different stakeholders and actors to get the reports out. So we're so appreciative of everyone who's involved. Um, I, I want to extend a special thanks to FHI360 for hosting us in this beautiful venue today. Um, and express appreciation to Saskia and Zach and David and Mohammed for your thoughtful remarks um, in the panel discussion on cross-cutting themes. Um, and then I wanted to thank all of you for joining us uh, throughout the morning and for your active participation um, and also for having just such an honest and robust discussion on these really important topics. Um, so we look forward to uh, continuing uh, these conversations. As, as Asta mentioned, this isn't the end of these. We just wanted to kind of spur and start some conversations and discussions, but we hope to move those forward um, with other convenings um, and, and other programming in, in the months to come. Um, and then I wanted to just hand off to Michael. I think he wanted to do the final closing. Um, and uh, Alex for the sort of logistical help. And I particularly wanted to thank, of course, in addition to all the thank yous that uh, we heard from Miriam, um, to e Eka and Asta, who, without whom, um, you know, this would not have happened. Um, Eka just stepped into this position. I think she's done a great job. Asta has been with us has been overseeing this program what, for two years almost now. So thank you to both of them, and thank you to all for coming and bearing with us.